Hey, Jantans and Jantanites, it's Jason Desmond from the Jantan Collective with a brand new discussion on what's up with that. This is where we question, we learn, and we grow. This time around, we seriously grow. But I tell you what, subscribe, like, and comment below because we love hearing from you. Maybe it's about something that we talked about before. Maybe you want us to talk about something else. Get in touch. Now, this statistic kind of jumped out at me. And uh, usually, uh, discussions like this happen in November or Movember, right? It's very popular. But uh, this was very disturbing for me. About one man in eight will be diagnosed with prostate cancer during his lifetime. Disturbing, yeah. Now, to tell us more about everything to do with men's uh, lower regions and everything, he's, he knows it all inside and out. It's a very good friend of mine, Dr. George Lee, consultant uro- uh, urological surgeon at Glen Eagles KL. And uh, Dr. Dr. George Lee is also known notoriously as Dr. G-Spot, I suppose. Uh, Doc, how are you feeling? I'm very good. Very excited. You know, <laughs> what can be better things to do to be with you? Talking about G-Spot and beyond, right? I'm very excited. Thank you very much for this great opportunity. I'm really looking forward to the interview. Now, the last time we had a chat, we had uh, we, we were on another platform that you had to control what you were saying. Right now, this is the best. I thing find that difficult online. to believe. I never <laughs> restrain myself. Actually, you know what, Doc? If you don't mind me uh, going back a bit, how did you get into this? I mean, like the newspaper articles are are huge. Uh, you're known as Doctor G Spot. How did that that thing start? Did you think that <laughs> you just sent in an article? How? No, 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 no. It's like um, you know, I used to write an article. Um, you know, it's I used to write for Sin Chiu. Believe it or not, I'm a, I mean, I'm I'm a Clanton really. Boy. Wow. This boy, Chinese ad all the way. And then in Sinchu, people ask me about, you know, prostate problems. It's all very boring, you know, Sinchu. And it's all very Chinese. Right, right. Then, Straight forward, you know, right. Yeah. So initially, my column was called Ask Dr. G. Then I thought, look, I, I want to be slightly different. I want it to be a bit innuendo, a bit provocative. <laughs> and then so after about two years, you know, um, they asked me, if you were to change the column name, what would you call it? I said, there are only two things I can do. I can play with the word G. It's either the GPS to G. Right, right. Or <laughs> putting Dr. G on the spot. Right, right. right. <laughs> Even though I know nothing about G spot, obviously I'm a urologist. I deal with all jantan. That's why right. I'm here. Right, right, right. But I think it is, it's catchy. It right. obviously put a st- um, kind of a sense of humor onto a very um, taboo subject of sex and sexual health, right? Yeah. I mean, even yourself, I would imagine not so shy, would say, you know, he knows everything about men's bits and, you know, all the yeah. issues uh, in the pants, you know? Even yeah. you will, will hold back when you mention the word penis, right? Okay, because people are... Uh, embarrassed when you talk about penis yeah it's a society and... kind of thing i suppose you're, you're, you're not supposed to say things like that right yeah i know well what am i going to call it you know oh, right the weaker... <laughs> exactly how did you get to your urolo- urology actually was it something that you were well, fascinated was with before? To do it, right <laughs> right in, in a way that like were you a kid and going i want to get into urology how, how did that start well a clantanese boy eating voodoo too much end up becoming a urologist <laughs> oh my god <laughs> No, no, no. Actually, I left, uh, you know, I left Klantan when I was 16 years old. I went to Cambridge to study medicine. I, in Cambridge, my basic degree was pharmacology. I learned mutations of cells in order to work out uh, how drugs were in cells. Right. And in Cambridge, um, because of my research work, involves a lot of transplants. And then um, urologists do kidney transplants. So urologists don't just deal with sexual health. To a lot of people, contrary to a lot of people's belief, I'm actually not a sexual health doctor. Sexual health only constitute 10% of my work. Right. I deal with kidney transplant, cancers in men and women. I deal with incontinence, kidney stones, enlarged prostates, children's foreskins, and all sorts of things that touches urine. So if you ask me, where did I get my first interest? I probably, when I was doing transplant, I find that urology is a subject that is incredibly um, challenging because it involves a plethora of subspecialties. Right. Like the ones I mentioned. Mm-mm. It can range from fertility yeah. to um, gender reassignment to serious things like prostate cancer. 
So I find that incredibly um, challenging. And what is most intriguing and attractive about urology is that we get to play with many toys, right? Wait, 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 wait hold on. Like, what do you mean by that? Okay, Seriously, you know, no. for you, you would imagine that, you know, sort of sex toys and that thing. Oh, well, no, but, no, um, no, not really. Yeah, no, no. Yeah. If you think about Li Shen Long, uh, you know, Singapore's prime minister, yep, he had yep. prostate cancer. Yep. And the first thing that he will recommend is robotic radical prostatectomy. We have modern technology that help us to solve patients' problems. So we have, you know, on a daily basis, I'll deal with laser of stones, short wave, robotic surgery, you know, um, or something called TURP. So our line of work constantly has... Uh, contact with cutting edge right. technology. And then that's what attracts me to it. So urology actually evolves a lot. And then, you know, for me, uh, after Cambridge, I went to Oxford and then I did transplant surgery in Oxford. And then after that, I went to London to do urology. I mean, I have sense of humor. And when people always yeah. ask me, how do you become a urologist? To be truthful, it's a fantastic job. But I always tell people in Cambridge, I work for somebody called Nigel Bollock in Oxford. No I work way. For somebody called John Dick. In London, I work for somebody called Andrew Ball. If you work for Ball, Dick and Bollock, you become a urologist. Oh my God, that is hilarious. And that's so, that's, that's a true story. That's crazy. It's a true story. If you don't believe me, guys, you just Google urologist names. You know, it's like Andrew Ball, John Dick, and also Nigel Bollock. They were all my bosses before. Oh my I'm God. I'm just glad I'm not called Willie Lee. <laughs> William Lee, uh, I think that would be a fantastic that would, urologist. That would be slightly tragic also in, in many ways, though. But well, you know what? self-advertising, I guess. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, silver lining have, in some way. Have you had to deal with a lot of misconceptions about urology when people um, talk Well, to you? first of all, when the most common misconception is that when women come to my clinic, they actually say, Doc, um, it's like, you know, you look after women mm -hmm. and then, you know, for men, they always get surprised when they see 30% of my clients are women. So as a urologist, we deal with women sexually transmitted infection. We deal with kidney stones, kidney right. cancer in women, incontinence. And then so women actually has urologic problems. So that is perhaps one of the commonest misconceptions. UTI as well, I suppose, right? Indeed, indeed. I mean, right. who else do you see if you have got yeah. UTI? Most people think urologists are sexual health predominantly, but it's the other way around. We deal with urological issues, but sexual health is one small part of our job. Is it true that because you deal with both men and women, right? Are women more open to talking about stuff like this with their urologists compared to men when they come to see you? Like, are they a bit more shy generally? Indeed. I mean, most people think guys are the tough guys with ego problems and yeah. that sort of thing. But the reality will tell you this thing. When a woman encounters any form of medical problems, let's say, for example, ranging from breast lumps to uh, issues with... Uh, blood in the urine, they will go and see a doctor much, much earlier than men. Right. However, when men has this problem, imagine someone like Lance Armstrong, who had testicular cancer of the yeah. age of 25. And he was look, keep looking at the testicle and said, I think it's getting smaller. It's okay. And then well, they is that what it is? That's because it gets smaller. Is that the, of I course, it, it doesn't. But the thing is that you try to convince yourself when it's somewhere sensitive like right, that. Right, right, right. Okay, okay. Shyness. Right. right. So that's one problem is that guys are always taught to tough it out. And yeah. that is really not an ideal situation. And the other thing which I feel is a bit unfair is that healthcare is designed not so kind to men. So therefore, I always say that mankind is not so kind to men. You imagine that a woman, even you're not ill, for example, mm -hmm. if you started having your period, you're pregnant, you're having menopause. And all these are natural part of your life. And you have contacts to doctors all the time. Yeah. And guys only see doctors when you're ill. And it's it's amazing thing that guys will service your car every year, but you will not service your body because you only fix your body when it's broken. Oh my God, that, that's very true. That is why it's compromising men's health and women's health. Yeah. You imagine that guys always... Um, have lower life expectancy compared to women. Hmm. Across the world, from Swaziland to Japan, there is a five-year discrepancy in life expectancy 
between men and women. A lot of people say that it's because men take risk in life. Men smoke more, drive faster car, drink mm. more. Yeah. Of course, those things play a role. But the key role is when men presented with diseases, they present late. And that's why urologists are here to save mankind. Good. I love it. And I love the fact that you made me think about it. It's like how we should treat our bodies like our car. Because Indeed. if you take care of our car really, really well, I mean, like we're constantly told, like you need to service it if you want it to last longer and everything. But we never do the same thing with our own bodies. Indeed. Yeah. And then there are many reasons. Some of them, it's out of lack of knowledge. Mm. You know, sometimes you ask men like, where's your prostate? And then, you know, you know, even educated people, some of them say, uh, is it next to your kidney? Yeah. You know, that sort of things. And then other thing, it's fear. Because men always have this uh, uh, phobia that if they fall ill, who's going to look after their family? Yes. And by acting like an ostrich to bury your head in, under the sand, it's not solving the problems. And a lot of them encounter a lot of complications if they present late with medical condition. Right. So then we're in denial most of the time, unfortunately. Right? I, I think we should stop thinking about, about doctors and and hospitals and everything as someone just to fix us constantly when we're, we're, we're broken, right? Correct. Just, Women don't think of it that way. They yeah. go for regular checkups, even though, you know, after pregnant, they take their kids to see doctors and that sort of thing. I think it's a society kind of like a, a design that, women and children care it's constantly there and i really think that needs to change if we stand any chance of catching up in uh, with the women's health when it comes to prostate cancer it's always talked about only in november and then we grow a mustache and it's november and everything but it's something that we should be talking about uh, all year long but how prevalent is prostate cancer among men okay I mean, yeah yeah, there are, there are two reasons why prostate cancer is increasing uh, in, uh, amongst men. Number one is that we get older. When we get older, the chances of prostate going wrong is higher. And the second thing is that we get better in detecting prostate cancer. Right. So in the old days, many men died uh, of prostate cancer with all other diseases You know that we don't know. However, in Malaysia... Two thirds of men presented with prostate cancer actually present late. So it's already fourth stage. And that is something that needs to change compared to developed countries. We are like 40 years uh, behind when wow. it comes to that, right? So when answering your question to say, how common is prostate yeah. cancer? It is common. However, obviously it's not as common as lung cancer and colon cancer. It's number four. However, it's because it's partly it's underdiagnosed and also it's partly because when men get older, there are other medical conditions that uh, it gets involved and lack of knowledge actually stop men from finding out they've got prostate problems. How, how do you know whether you've got a prostate problem early on? Now, besides just checking, going to the doctor and everything at a certain age, how do you, how do you feel it? There, there are you know? three ways that you will know you have prostate problems. Number one, is actually the symptoms. There are seven symptoms that tells you that something's not quite right. Number one is that when you start having nighttime urination. Number two okay. is that daytime, you go to toilet more often than your other peers of similar age. Number three is that when you get caught out, you don't have too much warning and sometimes you leak because whenever you need to go, you need to go very quickly. And sometimes men will begin to have problems with urination like a blockage. For example, we all have come across men who stand at the urinal. Yeah. You go in there, they're starting to urinate. By the time you finish and someone else has come in, they're still there. still hasn't started. Yeah, yeah. And that man needs to see me. And then okay. other things that will become apparent is that after they finish urinating, they retain urine. And then after they finish, they dribble. They are forcing the urine out. And all these are the seven symptoms that will determine someone has got prostate problems. Right. You and see, to be honest with you, I've... I've seen some guys at the uh, in probably toilets and everything, right? They, I, I, I always thought they, they do that. They make that sound. I'm like, what the heck is going on? Imagine, is that a imagine the force that you induce onto your bladder. Yeah, and that force itself is not empty. It could pr it put pressure on your kidneys. Some of these men ended up with kidney failure. Ooh. So it is a serious medical condition. Apart from that. 
The second way of finding out whether someone has got prostate problem is actually a simple blood test called prostate-specific antigen. Right. Prostate-specific antigen is a cancer marker. It's more appropriate to do it beyond the age of 40. You're absolutely right, Jason. You're way too young to do it. Right, right. Okay, yeah. However, Thank it's you. a good idea to build up some sort of good habit of regularly checking a blood test. And the third way to do it is something called digital rectal examination. I think people have the phobia about prostate being a really difficult thing to treat. It's because people imagine that if you have prostate problems, you need catheterization, yeah. that you're putting in, you need yeah. operation going through that tiny holes, and then you also need that big finger going yeah. inside the rectum. Interestingly, I can tell you I don't enjoy doing it, but right. it's necessary. Okay. You know, in medical school, we always say to medical students, if you don't put your finger in it, you put your foot in it. <laughs> wow. I love it, that. Yeah. It's because if you don't put the finger in it, because sometimes as doctors ourselves, because we don't want that messiness of feces and broken gloves when you put your finger in, you try to avoid that. You also don't want to embarrass patients. Yeah. But sometimes doing a digital rectal examination, you find the prostate is ragged, abnormal, enlarged, or even worse still, you feel a rectal cancer, that finger examination will save your life. Right. And besides, this finger makes me a lot of money as a urologist. And that's, I'm like, I was thinking about it, I'm like, that's like a golden finger that, that's really the, seriously the Midas touch. Yeah, so right. it's insured. Wow. Oh my God. Just joking. <laughs> well, can we check it ourselves? Show me your finger. I got, I got small hands. So yeah. Exactly. No, even you've got long hands, you won't be able to reach it. So you don't, you can't do it. Really? And also, it looks really weird if you stick your own finger up there and trying to see what you're trying to feel. Okay, I can do it. Maybe, maybe for the benefit of this show, you can just demonstrate how you want to do it. I, I'm, I'm fine. We, You're fine. Let's okay. move on to the next question. Okay. <laughs> All right. No, okay, the now. answer is you can't do digital rectal exam. Okay. Okay. And leave it to the professionals. And what, Absolutely. I remember when I, I did my test, they, they mentioned something about feeling for lumps or feeling right. for, right? Yeah. Is, that, is that what it, we're looking for? Any prostate that is enlarged, it should feel uniformly, homogeneously smooth and right. enlarged. And that is part of a normal aging process. When it feels nodular, ragged, and abnormal, we really worry about cancer. And then therefore, we need to put a small needle in there to retrieve some sample. It's called a biopsy. Yeah. And that is the only way for us to help you to exclude cancer. That's the probe thing, right? It is called transrectal ultrasound-guided yeah. biopsy. But the, the lumps doesn't necessarily mean that you have cancer, right? It's just... Correct, correct. But it needs to be excluded. Now, how do we prevent prostate cancer if there's, like, the nighttime urination, sometimes you, you leak, and then sometimes you're standing there at your urinal and it takes forever. How do we stop it from even happening? All those things I mentioned to you doesn't tell you you've got prostate cancer. Right. All those things that tells you is that you have prostate problems. But the thing is that how do you prevent those things from happening, like worsening of prostate symptoms, plus also the development of prostate cancer? Actually, there are two schools of thoughts. One school of thought is genetic. If somebody in your family, maternal side has got breast cancer, ovarian cancer, uterine cancer, yeah. it's correlating to something called the BRCA genes. The BRCA genes is exactly the same genes that actually induces breast cancer in someone like Angelina Jolie. So for men, the same genes can cause mutation and cause early stage prostate cancer in men. However, the vast majority of prostate cancer in men are the ones that is induced by lifestyle. For example, if your lifestyle is significantly higher in meat intake, low fiber, and then also consume food that is processed, a lot of pesticides. So of course, there are a lot of other issues uh, that may be related to cancer. In fact, we don't really know what causes cancer. And that is something that is probably lagging behind in research as well. 
If you look at breast cancer investigations and research, it's phenomenally big. It's because the limelight in research for female cancer is significantly bigger yeah. Yeah. than men's. And because we're only catching up in order to gain more momentum in shows like this, to get more men to be aware, and more men who are affected, for example, Nazir Raza, yeah. who openly talk about it, Lee Shen Long, who openly talk about it, only men who, go, who went through that put forward some resources trying to encourage more research, and only then we can find out more about the real causes and prevention of prostate cancer. I think the reason why I did my, my check was because Nazir came over to us, had a chat with us, and then he was like, why didn't you guys do a campaign? And then you, you should check it. Yeah, you yeah. should go and get it checked. And I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah, Jay's a good friend of mine. I and mean, then I saw him through uh, the, the process. And of course, even him at a young age of 51, when he uh, uh, was diagnosed with prostate cancer, he couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. In fact, when he called me, before his biopsy, I said, I cannot be lie. You're so young. Yeah. But it turned out, it turned out to be the best thing that he's done and best thing that saved his life. Right. But does it change his life uh, significantly that he has to go with treatments and this and that? Uh, well, he underwent an operation and that operation itself is definitively curative. So it will not require further chemotherapy or radiotherapy. And then the only difference after the operation is that he can no longer ejaculate because the true function of the prostate right. gland is to produce semen. And then after its removal, there's no organ to produce semen. Okay, right. So other than that, he can pee normally, he lives normally, and Absolutely. everything else looks fine. Absolutely. Someone like Li Shen Long lives normally. I suppose it's, it's not heartwarming. I'm trying to find the right word here. Like At least... Your, the, that's good quality of life after that even if you are diagnosed with prostate cancer you detect it early you go get it checked you go for the treatment it's reassuring so, that it's not the end of the world yeah way. and the, the worst case scenario is that you just can't ejaculate that's the that's the worst case exactly but the worst case scenario in 66 percent of malaysian men is death it's because they had the diagnosis too late so okay. for men who had present late with cancer already spread to the bones, you're not as lucky as Naze Raza when an operation can cure you. Unfortunately, that is the reality that 66% or more of Malaysian men, when they go to the doctors, they already have cancers in the bone, fourth stage cancer. Right. And the operation itself is not going to be, uh, going to be uh, effective or beneficial. When I did the test, I remember they told us to pee into this Machine. Flow machine. The flow machine, right? And that's actually to tell that you have that your, your tubes are, uh, are are well, I suppose. Is that the right term to use? Yeah, that? well, basically, when you were much younger, we all have peeing competition to see who can pee to the wall. Correct. Yeah, yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. Try to do that now, my friend. You will find it you'll struggle a little bit. And that itself is just a barometer to look at the velocity of the flow. And that will tell you what is the degree of obstruction that you will have. Eventually, okay. the prostate, it's, it's like a long kang, right? That long kang will eventually get clocked up. So for men, when is the ideal age? I suppose there's not a, no real ideal age. When's the if best time is, to start checking? If there is a... Uh, an history of prostate cancer or prostate problem in your house. 40 years old and above is the cutoff. If there is no family history, any man above 50 should really do a prostate check. I think all men should just go get a check regardless. And I think the one thing that gets everyone freaked out, and I, I have to tell everyone who's watching this right now, I have actually gone for the uh, test I've, I have actually gotten, gotten my blood checked. I've gone, done the flow. I've gotten the finger done. It is not scary. It is pretty normal. And I think I, I encourage everyone to actually go get it checked. And it shouldn't happen just because it's November and November and prostate cancer a month and you grow mustache and everything. It should just go. But another thing that recently came up was uh, you actually mentioned um, Lance Armstrong and also uh, a few other athletes I know. I actually have a friend who... Um, very young, actually, in his 30s, uh, had testicular cancer. Mm -hmm. That's a whole other ball game, Indeed. isn't it? Well, in fact, this the other extreme. We talk about prostate cancer affecting older men. Testicular cancer 
only affect younger men. Why is that? Imagine, imagine age of 18 to 38. That is the peak age. You have two peaks. One is at about 23. The other one is about 33. If you imagine that the uh, fastest growing cells in a man's body at a younger peak age of their sexual reproductive age mm. are the testicle. It's like an engine that is producing, is a powerhouse of your yeah. crown jewels, right? right? It's producing surge of testosterone and surge of, uh, um, of the testicle um, for sperms. And when that happens, it's growing too fast. And that is when things can go wrong. For example, if men who has got undescended testicle, your testicle as a child didn't drop into the scrotum. Right. So the temperature is slightly warmer and then things are more uh, uh, at risk of going wrong. And that is when testicular cancer can occur. There are two types of testicular cancer. One is called seminoma. The other one is called non-seminomatous germ cell tumor. And then these two types are effectively... Um, similar, but for us, we need to work out which type so that we can work out what is the best treatment. One good news, testicular cancer is the most curable cancer. So that's why everyone used Lance Armstrong as an example. But remember, he actually presented with testicular cancer at age of 25, 26, yeah. and it already spread to his brain. And then nobody in any form of other cancer will have good survival. And yeah. this guy, you know, after the removal, after chemo, six months later, seven times Tour de France. Yeah. You know, it's a living testimony that testicular cancer is the most curable cancer. So guys, if you are between 18 and 38, you just touch your balls whenever you're in shower. If you feel anything abnormal, you worry. Just go and see a doctor because we can easily detect that. What, what do you mean by abnormal though? Okay. So if you look at the back of your fist, it should be smooth, right? That yep. is the sort of like uh, texture. So your testicle should feel smooth and firm. And that's how the testicle should be. If okay. your testicle is like your knuckles, lumpy and painless, they have lots and lots of nodule lumpy. It feels like a rock that is within the, your balls, but actually doesn't feel like it belongs to you. Right, okay. And that is cancer. And don't be tricked. Most men who come to see me and say, but doctor, it's not painful. Testicular cancer is not painful. In fact, we have this terminology to say that it's a painful lump in the testicle is cancer until proven otherwise. Right. Okay, I, I always thought that skin cancer was, like in Lance Armstrong's case, a lot of people said, oh, it's because he was cycling all the time, the, the seats are small, and then there's abrasion and everything. He probably had like enlarged uh, balls and everything, right? That's if you not just the case, Google right? testicular cancer celebrities, mm -hmm. you can see half of them are athletes, half of them are rugby players, cricket players, and then right. American footballers, and a lot of them are young, active people. And then we can't tell you why. But the risk is that I think a lot of people are fit and healthy. And then when their testicular spermatogenesis is happening at its peak, and that's when things can potentially go wrong. So how do we uh, prevent this? Do we wear boxers well, or, or not briefs? The, is, only is risk, like the only risk of testicular cancer is that if you had an undescended testicle as a child. Right. So if you were born with one ball stuck, you are 50 times more at risk than general public. So check your balls every week to check uh, to feel for that knuckles lump. Right, right. If you don't have undescended testicle, it doesn't matter. So wearing tight underpants, don't wear underpants. But that's, underpants. The, that's the thing that everybody always says, right? Well, oh, you no, don't wear that's tight underwear, right? fertility. Oh, right, right. Okay. Yeah. So that's right. to enhance your spermatogenesis, but it is not for cancer prevention. Okay. So it doesn't matter what you wear. Just remember, it's the most curable cancer. So just go and see a doctor if anything goes wrong. And beyond 50 or beyond 40, there's no excuse to play with your balls. Right. Beyond that, just check your balls 
And even even though you're not really checking, you're just doing something else. <laughs> just say that you're checking. Out. Right, yeah. Because I think women check their breasts all the time for breast cancer. Exactly. I mean, What's wrong that. with checking the balls every yeah. day? Hey, it's part of your body. Yeah. I never actually realized that the term, like, when, have your balls dropped yet? I mean, it's an actual thing. Yeah, exactly. See, a child born, I mean, our testicle is designed to be away from the core body temperature. It's because it should have a cooling sac. And that is across the world for all the mammals. You see, the dogs have got like saggy pro, uh, yeah, yeah. So It's because the balls needs to hang. When it's hanging, it is away from your core body temperature. It's about 0.7 degree lower than the 37 degrees of your core body temperature. Right. It's because that's the only time that or only environment that the spermatogenesis can happen with its optimal effect. Right, because you don't want to be cooking your, your sperm inside, right? That's, that's exactly. Amazing. So if you right. want to have babies, you know, you don't want the balls too close to your body. Right. Actually, you know what? Let's talk about a fertility lab, since you actually mentioned it, because uh, I, I, I don't, I, I've been looking high and low for this article. I, I'm sure I saw it. Um, there, it was a discussion, not so much a study, but someone actually mentioned that COVID is causing men to be uh, less fertile. Okay. Is it mental? It's true. Well, there are two uh, male fertility and sexual health uh, studies that actually has been uh, quoted. One is that if you get COVID, the chances of erectile dysfunction is higher by threefolds. Right. Right. And then it's probably because it lowers the circulation. Imagine that COVID is a systemic problem. Okay. It may affect the circulations and then not just to the lungs, to testicles, to your penis, to everywhere. So the Italians worked out that even if you take into account of issues of um, stress, lack of job, and then, you know, the anxiety after getting COVID the chance of getting erectile dysfunction is 9% in someone who has no COVID versus 27%. The second two studies that actually highlighted that men who died of COVID, actually we found the testicle itself still have the COVID virus. So the COVID virus will actually invade into the testicle. And men who survived COVID, they actually have lower sperm count, less motility, and worsen morphology. Yes, it affects that. And also another study to show that even someone who recovered from COVID, when they undergo fertility treatment, when they have a biopsy of the testicle, and then they can still find fragments of that virus inside the testicle. So increasingly, we're uh, unraveling more and more data to show that COVID itself will have adverse impact onto your reproductive and sexual health in men. Even if you're like asymptomatic, does that affect you? I wonder? Indeed, indeed. Because the virus itself can cause damage to different organs, even mm. though you're asymptomatic as far as COVID right. is concerned. But you don't really have any symptoms if it affects the quality of your semen. Yeah. And you only know when you're trying to, to have a baby and, and see, then your, your right. fingers don't work, right? Okay. And how much of erectile dysfunction is... Because I read this also, they said men are more stressed, they're at home, they can't go out. And then how much of erectile dysfunction or... not? Well, the Italian study mental? looked at the men who had COVID versus men who don't have COVID. Right. So during the lockdown, the rate of erectile dysfunction in Italian men, it's about 9%. So that is all the lockdown, the fear, being stra- uh, you know, being locked together with your wife and then who'll probably get the rotan up and say, look, you need to perform. Yeah. <laughs> and that, that can be true because, you know, if a man already have a problem with sexual dysfunction and then, you know, they can always avoid sex. Yeah. But when you're living together and you don't have an excuse to say, I'm going out with my friends for a drink anymore, then when you're under that sort of pressure, sometimes it can be extremely anxious and you know, extremely uh, stressful. It's On the right. other hand, men who already contracted COVID, the risk of erectile dysfunction is like 9% versus the ones who have no COVID, who are stressed. So 9% is the st- uh, statistic. And then versus 27% of erectile dysfunction if you contracted COVID. Right. Is it also true that not ejaculating often enough 
contributes to erectile dysfunction? Um, the, there are some Taiwanese studies to show that not ejaculating enough can cause prostatitis, which is an infection of your prostate. That right. itself can cause sexual dysfunction, such as erectile dysfunction. Right. So um, there is no real study to show that lack of ejaculation can induce erectile dysfunction. But there are lots of studies to show that frequent ejaculation actually is not detrimental to the prostate health. For example, if you ejaculate more often, in fact, uh, you will reduce your risk of getting prostate cancer rather than increasing your risk of getting prostate cancer. And, you know, in the Asian culture, you're always told that if you ejaculate too much, later on you go blind. And then Correct. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yes. You go get erectile dysfunction and you lose your kidney function. Your chi is gone and you never have children be, uh, again in the future. Yeah. And all that actually contrary to the um, Eastern belief, Australia and also uh, US has done studies to show that frequent ejaculation actually improved the overall uh, functions of the sperms and also motility of the sperms because they believe that the constant turnaround, turnover, actually improve fresher sperms for fertility. And how, how frequent is frequent? Okay, that's a question I'm going to ask you. You think you're doing all the questioning. Yeah, okay. so your friend, you know, in order to reduce your risk of getting prostate cancer by 25%, how frequent is frequent? This is a massive study of more than 30,000 people in Massachusetts published by Harvard Medical School. So if you want to reduce your risk of prostate cancer by 25%, my friend, how often should you ejaculate in a typical month? I'm thinking at least twice a week, so maybe eight times a month. Eight times a month, higher. Really? Really? Wow. So See, what, you need every to catch other up. day? You think you're already doing well. <laughs> really? So every yes. other day, I should be... I, so when people say, come again, it's actually real. So I'm like, every other day, I should, I should just let it go? Well, that is a little bit of double meaning, come again. <laughs> I know exactly, right? So if I do it one uh, every other day, well, that would mean roughly three... Actually, to be truthful, Jason, your, the statistic that you quoted, under 40 years old, a Malaysian man or Malaysian couple actually have sex or ejaculate about twice a week. This is about eight times a month. Right. But that study showed that if you ejaculate around 21 times a month, you can reduce your risk of getting prostate cancer. 21 by... times a month? That's... That's a lot, isn't it? You need to see me, my friend. Oh, really? I'm a busy guy, man. I've got a lot of things going on. I have heard of many excuses and that <laughs> is the lame one. Okay, okay. All right. Yeah, I, I, that's another thing I read. Uh, and, and, Your friend. And this, this, uh, right. About my friend, right? There's all these myths and things that people say, oh, it's going to reduce the sperm count. Or it's because, because you don't ejaculate often enough it's actually caught in your in your testicles and then after that uh because it's it's a testosterone it heats up and everything that's why you you have uh your body temperature too heaty. is it too heaty exactly yeah is it true no it's not true it's not true i mean we study uh you know uh, studies in monks you know who obviously don't ejaculate we realize that eventually your body will take over the metabolic process will take over However, people may feel uncomfortable because sometimes during the process of metabolic changes, and then you will see inflammations. Because after all, our sperms are actually a foreign body because our whole body has our full genetic material, but our gametes actually has a half of our genetic material. So sometimes um, there is a barrier called blood testicular barrier. So our body can never have white cell going into the testicle to mess up the things. But whenever you have accumulation of the sperm causing inflammations, your body will have heightened reaction thinking that this is a foreign body because it only contains half of your bodily uh, genetic material. I, I've listed out some of the, the things I've heard about erectile dysfunction, not the myths and what whatnot. But what are the top three reasons why erectile dysfunction actually happens a lot? Okay, well, masturbation causing the erectile dysfunction, myth, because okay. masturbation itself actually uh, doesn't, you, you don't use it, you lose it. That's true. Yeah. I like that. Okay, so you got to keep servicing it. Okay, cool. Right, right. okay. 
And too much masturbation will cause your kidney to fail because a Chinese believe that your chi is all that chi. Yeah. And then, you know, if you use it too much, you use up all your quota. And some people save it all until they are 70. And then they suddenly realize that their quota is really gone because they wasted it all in their youth right. and then they never even used it, right? Because you want to save it for the special whatever it is. Yeah, right? yeah hello. Yeah. You might not have special days after COVID. Right. Yeah, that's true. So, yeah. yeah, you might as well just enjoy it while you. The can, rainy days right? are here, right? Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So the last thing, perhaps, is that you know erectile dysfunction is all in your mind, right? Mm. But actually, eighty percent of erectile dysfunction is associated with your bad start lifestyle. For example, if you have got blood pressure problem, if you got dyslipidemia, if you have got uh, diabetes, if you are taking way too many. Uh, antihypertensive medication, if you're not sleeping enough, if you are stressed, and then if you're not exercising, if you're obese, and all these are contributing towards your erectile dysfunction, it's not all in your mind. So when Malaysian Health and um, uh, Morbidity Survey highlighted that, you know, something like one third of young men in Malaysia actually age 18 to 29, have got erectile dysfunction. It's not a wrong data. It's because younger men has got problem of obesity, smoking, uh, yeah, diabetes, yeah, yeah. hypertension, and all these is contributing towards bad overall health and poor sexual health. It's actually more, when you have erectile dysfunction, it's actually a signal to say that you're doing everything else wrong in your life, isn't Correct. it? Correct. And then it is a barometer of poor health. And then it's usually a prerequisite of something wrong is going to happen to you soon. It's more concerning than just like, oh, we're not going to have a baby. That's a lot more concerning Correct. to your so, health. So isn't when, it? You know, when my mom always nagged me and said, hey, you know, I sent you to UK, you went to Cambridge, you went to Oxford, and now you're selling like, you know, Chinese say chun yao. Chun yao just mean like, you know, like a, Oh, oh, but all right. <laughs> okay. Yeah. 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 So right. You degrade yourself to just selling like you know, the blue pills. Right. I said, Mom, but, but at the end of the day, it is sexual health. It's an indicator of the overall health. Something is going wrong. So yeah. if we have an opportunity to fix the sexual health and the overall health, we will save many lives. On that though, it's not that you mentioned it. If you're, let's just say you're leading a, unhealthy life and whatnot and then uh, you have erectile dysfunction and you basically can't get it up anymore whatever and then uh, you think about maybe i should take the blue pill but then there are all these other um Tonka Ali. yeah exactly oh yeah, yeah. but sometimes not even, i don't know what they are because i sometimes if i'm driving around i see uh, uh some kind of signage some dodgy signage at some uh, traffic light exactly. uh, but quite the lucky i'm like what the heck are those? yeah what are those yeah so, well, put it this way, right? I mean, if you treasure your life enough, right, will you put the unknown pill in your mouth just because of embarrassment, right? Yeah. There are studies to show that the content, the uh, contamination, it is adulterated drugs because it's unregulated. It's because people out there are actually cashing in and taking advantage of your embarrassment and the taboo because you're too embarrassed to go and see doctors so you might as well just buy some pills off the road so that you put in your mouth and things that it might work right if you're lucky it's a fake drug if you're not lucky it's the end of your life but what about the blue pill though the blue pill what was not specifically designed for that, it was actually a heart medication. But it was specifically um, designed for high blood pressure. Right. And when they realized that it didn't work for blood pressure and it woken the kraken. Right. Exactly. And then suddenly, yeah. Pfizer has a new riser. <laughs> there, there are, I heard there was, there was uh, some stiff uh, uh, <laughs> competition when it came to that. It's a hard topic. I know, right? <laughs> But that is because it comes from a reputed, a highly reputed uh, pharmaceutical company. Is that kind of safer? Because you can get yes. it. Yes. Can you well, get it because, off, over well, the counter? I mean, it went through the scrutiny of placebo. It's a most scrutinized drug. Do yeah. you know how long the blue pill has been around? How long? It's been around for 23 years. And have you tried it? Hey, I 
dispense medication. You think I don't try medications that I you have to try yourself, right? I don't know. My friend told me it works. And how long? Uh, it's not a cure, isn't it? I mean, it's it's more like I Actually, need it now. The cure is very simple: sleep more than seven hours, hydrate more, exercise mm. more, don't eat fat things, and also try to reduce stress at work. Then right, your erection will come back. Okay, so it is not a cure all. The blue pill, it, regardless of what people say, right? So it works. Oh, this is yeah. I I don't know. I've I've had a similar. One from a from another pharmaceutical company. That's why I said there was some stiff competition, right? So they said, "Try it out." I'm like, "Okay," and it's, it was for another campaign. So I did. I didn't feel any. Maybe it was because I was too young. Maybe I didn't feel it. Do you feel difference? Uh, a difference when you're older, and then you take it as like, "Hello, you haven't been around for a while." You need to see me. <laughs> This is very interesting. We have to have to chat again, man. Yeah. All right, Doctor George Lee. We are talking about a lot of things. We've been talking about prostate cancer. We're talking about uh, getting your prostate checked regularly, getting a better life, uh, leading a better life with uh, healthier eating, fitness, and everything will come back into place. Is there anything else we should know about? Because it's not purely about sex. Right when we when we first wanted to talk about this, it was a mini prostate cancer, but then a lot of other things came into place. Um, what else should we know about taking care of our nether regions? I suppose. I, well, you know, you're right. It's not about sex, but sex gets a lot of attention. Yeah, yeah. Well, I guess the two advice I would give it's not just it's not just taking care of the nether region. It's taking care of your overall health, and your nether region is part of your bodily total total function. Mm. Therefore, you take a, take care of your overall health, then your nether region will behave itself, right? Okay. And in addition to that, actually, it's not just the um, sexual health that you need to look after. You know, for example, um, the when you reach certain age, colon cancer, and then also um, lung cancers are quite prevalent. So the interesting thing is that reduce all the bad habits. Someone once told me, before the age of 40, you can abuse your body like anything. Mm, mm, mm. After age of 40, your, your body will abuse you like anything. Yeah. So all the things that you, the bad habits, all the uh, things that you think you can do, all the food, rich food that you eat, all Alcohol. your life, correct. And then you think you can get away with it at the age of 50 and beyond, you can think again. And because of the eating habit, the exercise, and all these are the investment that you need to put in, not just for your sexual health, it's for your overall health. So I think if you think of it that way, then sex is not compartmentalized into a separate entity. It's yeah. your overall health. So therefore, there's no need to be embarrassed about anything. And also, when you look after the entirely, the entire, uh, you know, uh, holistically, then you benefit everything. Again, I think we have got to look at our bodies, men um, specifically. We have got to look at our bodies like like a car. Really, it's like checking the tires, checking the fluids, checking the what everything. Right. So Indeed. this is. This is very interesting. But one last thing before you go, Doc, I just need to, to ask you, all right? I'm sorry, I had to go back to uh, this because someone just asked me this because we didn't, they knew I was going to have a chat with you. The difference between a man who's single, stays single much later, and then he never, let's say he ne- never gets married, and then he doesn't have sex, and then he masturbates, compared to a man who has a wife and he has regular sex, does that make a difference between masturbation uh, ejaculation and sex ejaculation? No, no difference at all. The ejaculation process itself, it goes through uh, four phases. First of all, the libido, the feeling that you want to have sex. Okay. Then secondly, the actual circulation. Then, you know, just to get the engorgement of the penis. And then followed by that whole um, shebang of the uh, climax and ejaculation and then detumescent, then that right. kind of relaxations, right? Okay. So that process goes through exact same uh, stages, whether it's penetrative sex or masturbation. Right. However, 
there are a lot of studies to show that men who masturbate so much that when they have real life sex, they might have some difficulties. It's because real life sex, you need to put in effort, you need to have the stamina, you need to take your date out, you need to do all sorts of things. And men get lazy because their right hand just becomes their best friend, right? <laughs> God, right? This is my girlfriend in the way, right? Yeah, now. that's right. And yeah. if so, then they don't have that relationship investment. And therefore, I see many men who say, oh, I can't perform whenever uh, you know, I'm with real life person. It's because you got lazy. Right, right? yeah. You need to invest in the relationship. It's not just relationship with your right hand. Yeah, okay? get healthy. And then on the other hand, you know, a man who... Who says he's on the other hand, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. on the <laughs> other hand, and a man in the proper relationship, and then later on started feeling like, oh, I shouldn't be masturbating because I feel like I'm cheating my wife. However, having sex with my wife is just putting too much effort and then, you know, that sort of thing and start having that. And then again, it becomes an emotional issue or so psychological issues it because they feel like they shouldn't be doing that and that guilt sensations. And I right. think the best thing to do is just be open, right? Be completely open communication, nothing to hide because if you can share the same bed, there's nothing that you need to hide from each other. That's true. Now, you know what? Because this is the Jantan Collective, we're trying to make men better versions of themselves. And having a chat like this, we're educating men about their own bodies, how they, how they need to take care of it. But in general, also, we want to make them better as well, make us better. So let's get straight into it. This can be rapid fire, can be short answers, can be long questions, long answers is up to you. But Dr. George Lee, any advice for jantans out there to be better versions of themselves because we are the jantan collective. Yeah, treat your body like your car. Look after it, service it regularly. <laughs> what do you think is the biggest challenge that's facing jantans today in this day and age? Ego. You know, your ego is getting better. Uh, um, you know, it's actually set you back. Whenever you don't have ego, then you look after yourself. You constantly do a checkup. And also, don't be embarrassed to, uh, whenever you face problems of health, don't be embarrassed to seek for help because that ego itself might kill you. So be careful. Although ego is our characteristics, but sometimes ego can be um, uh, can cause adversity for you. Ego is not just a feeling, right? Ego can actually do some physical harm, right? Exactly. All right. So knowing that, what should us jantans do better? In life in general? In life in general, I think we should really um, embrace life. I mean, be thankful for what you have. Um, you know, all the time, a lot of us have been fit and healthy. And I think embrace life and actually keep it like that. So basically, don't give up. There's no, nothing as being too late, you know. So even if you put on a lot of weight, you've given up all that um, kind of like looking good, you know, feeling good about yourself, there's never too late. There's always a uh, time for you to reverse a lot of damages you've done to your health. Any messages for um, Jantans who are suffering at this time? Actually, you know what? Any, any message for anyone who's suffering at this time? Well, that's the other thing that we didn't touch on. It's about mental health, right? About mm -hmm. suffering. And it's like a lot of time when we pre-pandemic BC or before COVID, right? Yeah. It's, it's always, we have ways to catch up with our friends, talk about things, and then it being, um, you know, our peers or men, you know, we can openly talk about all sorts of things. And then obviously when during the lockdown, you worry about whether you can um, put food on the table, whether your job's going to be secured or not, whether you're going to catch COVID. If you catch COVID, whether you're going to die, who's going to look after your kids? And those things, all men, I can tell you, suffer in silence. They don't want to talk about it because they feel helpless and they feel hopeless. I can tell you one thing to do is basically we talk about it. It's better for your mental health. And then you have no idea how resilient you are with, uh, you know, with adversity. And that is what makes us jantan is because our testosterone and our resilience. And stay strong because you know you can do it. We have seen many, many bad times in our lives. The best thing about Jantan is that we can always get out of the darkness. I think a lot of what a lot of Jantans fear is that the moment they go and seek help or they want to talk to someone about their, their mental 
anguish or whatever they're going through, they, they, they seem weak. That's an ego, right? I mean, so yeah. we talk to another Jantan, then we seem weak together. That's fine. I like that. On yeah. that note, Dr. George Lee, thank you very, very much. My absolute pleasure. Signing off and hopefully you enjoy the program. That was a very eye-opening discussion, and I hope you enjoyed the discussion that we had with Dr. George. Uh, what new thing did you learn? Uh, did we miss anything that you would love to know? Get in touch with us right now. Let us know in the comments down below. But thank you so much for watching. We hope you learned something. We hope we opened your eyes to this and that it's not taboo to check your lower regions, all right? And as usual, very apt that I'm going to say this this time around, don't be a dick. <laughs>